Good morning, everybody. And welcome. My name is Rick Thompson. I'm the pastor here at Living Water Community Church. I want to welcome you to our graduation Sunday, where we recognize all those who have put in the hard work of graduating from one grade or station to another. And again, that's going to happen specifically at the end of the service, so I want you to stay tuned. But, but recognizing them kind of fits right in, in line with our family series um, that we've entitled A Fuller House. Say A Fuller House. Based on John 10.10, 10, which says that the thief comes only to, to kill, steal, and destroy. This is what Jesus said. He said, but I have come that you might have life and that life to the fullest. The Satan is trying to rob from you. God is trying to give you a fuller or a better life. To me, it's a no-brainer. Come on, somebody, as to who, who you should be uh, running fully after. It's a no-brainer. Follow after Jesus with all your heart. Amen? And hopefully in this series, we've, we've kind of uncovered more than just a few small nuggets of wisdom as we highlight what our roles should be if we're going to walk in that full of life that Jesus promised to every single one of us. Now, last week, we talked about the role of the single. Where are my single people at? Come on, somebody. If, if you missed last week's message, just jump online. You can go check it out. It's worth checking it out again. In previous weeks, we've talked about the role of the husband and the wives, and there's specific things that if you're going to have a fuller life, uh, or a blessed life, you're going to start to do things God's way. Amen? And he has, a, he has a role for us to play. Now, probably one of the most challenging twists and turns that come our way is after marriage. Someone say after marriage. And you, you all remember that old nursery rhyme that we used to sing and tease each other? We used to find two people that, who might have been dating or giving Google eyes at each other. And then we start to sing, you know, let's just say, Bill and Teresa sitting on a tree. Come on, somebody. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes, then and then comes a baby in a baby carriage. So you guys remember, right? All the young people don't know what we're talking about. You don't know what we're talking about. But I promise you, this is what we used to say to tease the people who are making Google eyes at each other. And, 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 so, and so first comes love, then comes marriage, and then comes the babies and the baby carries. And that's when the fun actually really begins. Now, there are those who have said, I, I wish there was a manual to raising kids. And as always, I like to suggest to them that there is a manual to raising kids. Come on, somebody. We've been talking about that manual, the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible. And in the Bible, this is what it says. Psalms 127, verse 3. It says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a real blessing. I haven't, haven't raised four children of my own which are now adults, that has been my go-to verse over the years, especially when they were younger, and getting on my last nerve. <laughs> Was it just my kids that would get on? They're a blessing. They're a blessing. When, when they'd fight each other and they just wouldn't stop, Lord, remind me that they're a blessing. When I get a phone call from their school after concerning their behavior, it wasn't all my kids. I'm not going to mention no names. Someone might be listening right now online. Uh, I would have to remind myself that they're a blessing. When I tell them to do their chores or to clean their room for the umpteen time and it didn't happen, I, 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 besides, you know, trying to hold on to my, keep my peace, I would have to remind myself that these kids are a blessing from the Lord. Come on, somebody. Sometimes we got to remind ourselves. And, and I, I don't care. Lord, these kids are a blessing. I don't care what you hear. See, that's my story. I'm sticking with it. Now, guess what? They've grown up. And... They, and, and they've been a blessing, or they continue to be a blessing, and two of them are giving birth to their own blessings of their own. And so, and so they get to repeat the cycle, and now it's their time. Because grandparents, man, if I'd known grandparenting was so good, I would have started with the grandkids. I promise you. I promise you, because the grandkids, when the grandkids get on your nerves, I'm just, just, just cover your little ears. Sometimes if you're watching, if they get on your nerves, this way, you can give them back to the parents. Oh, my goodness. Come get your child. Come on. It's over. It's time. Go. I'm, 
grandpa's going to bed, <laughs> you know? But we didn't have that option with the kids, right? They were just there. And so you're constantly talking, but now they get to get that cycle. Dad, dad, you want to watch the kids? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I, I put my time in already. Come on, somebody. So, so I've learned over the years to say what God says and to make what God says my declaration rather than what I think or what I feel or even what I see. So that's why I said we have to take our cues from the word and not the world. Amen. Amen? From the word and not the world. Now, this is what the word says concerning marriage and children and so forth. In Malachi 2, verse 15, the message, it says, God, not you, made marriage. Now, can I just go ahead and add on to this that it's God, not me, not the Supreme Court. Come on, somebody. Of America. It's God. How many know that there's a higher court than our Supreme Court? Come on, somebody. I know we, 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 this is the Supreme Court. Well, there's a Supreme Court than the court that we have. Did I say that right? Anyway. But it's God that's one, that sets the parameter. It's God that made marriage. This is what he goes on to say. He says, his spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And what does he want from marriage? Ready? Children of God. That's what. So God, the spirit of marriage within you. And then he goes on to say, he said, don't cheat on your spouse. That's the message. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. This is what it says. It says, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Come on, somebody, help me out. He wants godly children from your union. So guard yourself and remain loyal to your wife of your youth. Folks, what does God want? That's your first feeling. He wants godly children. He wants godly children. Ta-da! He wants, when he brought you guys together, that, that the byproduct of you getting together is that you're going to produce something, and that, that production, that, that when he lent you those kids, he gave you those kids on loan, he entrusted you to raise them, he wants you to, to produce godly children. That's what he wants. Children that are a blessing from the Lord. Amen? Not just in declaration, but in practice. Now, that's what God wants. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's always the easiest thing to do. Come on, somebody. Anybody have any kids who are a little bit difficult? Come on, somebody. Is it just me that had the difficult kids? Look, look, they're walking out. Come back. <laughs> We're talking about the kids today, right? And so, and so it doesn't mean that it's easy, but as difficult as it can be, that's part of our mission. That's our mission our, and our mandate while we are still here on this earth. Now, let me let you in on a little secret as it relates to marriage and family and children. Jesus was asked, uh, he was, he was uh, people came to him with a, with a question, a, a kind of gotcha question, people who didn't believe in the resurrection. And they came up with the scenario of this woman who was married to this one guy and her husband died. And then so she married the brother, and then he died, and, and he had, which was a custom in the Jewish tradition that if, if, if you married somebody in the family, it was the responsibility of the family to continue to marry that person and produce children for the, for the deceased person. Well, they dragged this thing out to seven kids, all right, only seven men who had died. Now, I don't know what's going on with this woman, but I promise you, right around the third one, I'll be like, no, I'm not marrying this woman. But anyway... They presented this, this, this scenario to Jesus, and then they asked Jesus, all seven of them died and they're in heaven, which wife, who does she belong to as a wife? And Jesus didn't even bat an eye. He says, you don't know the power of God, and you don't, know, you don't exactly know basically what God is doing or what's going on. He says, when you get to heaven, you are neither married nor are you giving into marriage. He says, you, are, you, you become just like the angels. And so, and so there, there's not going to be this, will we know each other? Yes, we will know even as we're fully known. I, I mean, I hate to break this to the Mormons and all these other religions that are telling you that you're going to have spiritual children and we're all, we're all going to have a bunch of kids when we, when we get married and all that nonsense. Jesus said, no, you're going to become just like the angels. And exactly what our role is in that capacity, we don't know. But we know that it's not going to be marriage and giving children. So, 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 so 
I said all that to say this. You, you have one opportunity to, to, have, to have this marriage and to have children and us here on this earth. Amen? And while you're here, God expects us to raise godly children. And, and that's our mandate. And that's our role. But it's not just our role. It's the role of the entire church. Amen? It, it, you've heard that statement where it says it takes a village to, to raise a family. Well, God expects our church to come alongside of us and to help us to raise our kids. They should not be getting a different message from my home that they would get at church. Amen? And so, and so that's why whenever we do a, a baby dedication, one of the things I do is I charge the parents. I said, now you are, you, the, 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 the family members, the friends and everybody, they uh, bring them up front. You've seen it. And then I charge them before God and everybody else that you are going to try to raise these kids in the fair and ammunition of the Lord. And then I, and then I charge the church and we are going to come alongside them to do that. Amen. So these kids are going to hang out here from time to time. They're going to be here on, 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 on Sundays. They're going to be here on Wednesdays. They're here on different days. And it's our job also to help you and to help each other to raise our kids in an environment that's going to create godly children. Amen. Amen. And, and, and folks, this is the only institution that's doing it. I mean, this is basically the only institution that's standing for godly principles because everything else in the world seems to be pulling them off in different directions and pulling them off into different things that, that, that God is not asking them to do. And, and so this is what the Bible says in Titus 2, 4, 4 and 5. It, it goes on to say, these older women must train, someone say train, the younger women. And what are they telling them to train them in? He says, women to, to love their husbands and their children to live wisely and to be pure, to take care of their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not be bringing shame onto the word of God. Now, I want, if, you're, if, you're, if you're following along on your piece of paper, I want you to write down the word train, train. And it's a verb, and it means to learn the skills necessary to do a job or to teach somebody especially through practical experience. The, to learn the skills necessary to do a job or to teach someone, especially through practical experience. And so, so the mandate of the word is that if you're old in the Lord, maybe you're further along, that when the younger kids come along, part of your ministry is also to train up them, them to, to love their husbands and to raise godly children. It, 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 am I taking any of this out of context so far, right? And so it becomes cyclical. I raise my family, then when they grow up, then I help my kids raise their kids. Come on, somebody. And the whole goal is to continue to produce godly children, people with a People with a heart after God. Amen? Amen? And, so, and so the word train is also the same word that's used in Proverbs 22, 6. And this is what it says to the parent. It says, train a child in the way they should go. And when he is old, he will not turn away from it. That's the NIV. The New Living says it this way. It says, teach your, ch your children who... who Who's supposed to teach your children? Help me out, somebody. Yeah. Turn to someone and say, we are. Yeah. Teach your children, it goes on to say, to choose the right path. And when they are older, they will remain upon it. Amen. So teach them means don't leave them to teach themselves. Come on, Come on somebody. Yeah. And don't leave it to the government to teach them. Come on, somebody. Yeah. It is our responsibility to teach our children. Teach them, the Bible says, right from wrong or the path of right. And if there's a right path, how many of you know there's a wrong path? And children need to be taught it. How many of you know children don't need to be taught to lie? They already know how to lie. Children don't need to be taught, you know, how to, 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 to you know, they got to be taught to share things. They don't want to share. Come on, somebody. And so you got to teach. Check. There we go. You got to teach them the right thing. Teach them the right way to go. That means, again, I'm not just sending them to church. Come on, somebody. How many know sometimes we got to teach by example? I'm bringing them to church. Amen? That means I'm not just reading the Bible. That's good. But I'm showing them by example that I'm also reading the Bible and the Word of God is important to me as well. That means I'm not just sitting when I get here to church, but how many know that God has called us not just to sit, but he's called us to serve. 
He called us to serve, and I'm emulating that because if it's a priority for me and my children are now looking at me, guess what? Then they're going to say, okay, it's a priority for, for dad. It's also going to be a priority for me. Amen. And so we're not just called to sit, but we are called to serve. And I'm, and I, and I'm doing this by showing them an, an example in my life. Now, when, when I need to correct their behavior, it means I'm not hesitating either. Amen? That means that I'm going to start to deal with it. And I'm not going to leave it to the teacher to do it or the administrator to do it or, or worse, the police officer to do it. Come on, somebody. I, 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 you've heard me say this before, but I would rather discipline my own kids than have the police have to do it. Come on, somebody. I would rather, I would rather have to put the fear in them my own self because I know that when it comes, when it comes down to it, you know, they're going to survive one of my disciplines. Come on, somebody. I'm, sometimes I'm not sh quite so sure because the people are trigger happy and all this other stuff. I want to be able to discipline my own kids so that I know they're going to live. Amen? Amen? And so and I'm not waiting for anybody else. Now, this is what the Word of God says in Proverbs 23, verse 13. It says, don't hesitate to discipline your children. A good spanking won't kill them. Come on, somebody. As a matter of fact, it says it may save their lives. I'm just, I think I'm going to read that one again. It says, don't hesitate to discipline your children. A good spanking won't kill them. As a matter of fact, it may save their lives. Now, listen to me. I know spankings have become counterculture today. And when I say spanking the child, I'm not talking about abusing your children. I'm not talking about, you know, putting them in the hospital and leaving all sorts of bruises on them. But, but, but there needs to be some kind of balance here because, because we're raising children today and we're raising a whole lot of what I call entitled, undisciplined children. I came across a Tom and Jerry meme we could, uh, or Jeff. We couldn't quite get it to work, but, but it says what some kids need today. Did, did we get that? Oh, there we go. Oh, my God. You got it. You guys are my heroes. Amen. That's what some kids need today. That's what they need instead of participation trophies. Come on, somebody. Uh, and safe spaces. You've offended me. Oh, my goodness, guys. I'm... Anyway. That's what they need. The, the application of, of, of the rod of discipline to the seed of correction in repeated intervals to get them to change their behavior from time to time. And so in Proverbs 19 verse 18 says, correct your children while there is still hope. Do not let them destroy themselves. Now, can I just let you in a little secret? You've got to start young. Because if you wait to the 14 and 15 and 16, how many know the horse is out, already out of the barn? Pastor Rick, I can't control my teenage. Well, what did you do when they were acting up at 4 and 5 and 6? What did you do when they were giving you back talk at 7 and 8 and, 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 and now cussing you out at 10 and 11? What did you do? I mean, I'm grateful for uh, being raised in a by my Jamaican mama. Come on, somebody. <laughs> in a Caribbean home, I was watching some show on TV and these kids from England who are totally out of control on drugs, wearing black, cussing their parents out, not going to school. And they, they took these kids who are in, from Europe and even from America, and the same situation, they're, they're totally out of control. And they plucked those kids out and they put them in a home in Jamaica. Someone say, someone say one week later. <laughs> totally different child. See, the problem wasn't the child. It was the parents. The, that Jamaican mama said, hey, you will get up and do chores. No, I won't. What? <laughs> and mate, you will go to school. Well, I don't feel like I'm, What? You going to school. You're doing chores. You're helping around the house. There is no options. See, my house is, <laughs> I've been in youth ministry for many years. I promise you, I've been dealing with kids for a long time. I, I had this one young lady who came and she was a teenager. She said, Pastor Rick, I, I wish I could come live in your house. I'm like, yeah, yeah. 
you, you can live in my house. Why? Why not? Why not? Sound shock. I said, because I hear the way you talk to your mama and your dad. You'd have a hard time walking around with my foot up your behind <laughs> if you talk to me that way. It's better that we have the pastor, youth pastor relationship because I promise you none of that would work in my house. And so we're afraid to discipline our kids, and we're raising these self-entitled kids who are talking back and doing all sorts of things. And then we're surprised when they're doing it to the teachers. If my kids acted out in school and I had to be called, that's where we dealt with it. We had a rule. If you act up in public, I'm dealing with it in public. I got great kids today. And they love us. So it goes on to say in Proverbs 22, 15, every child is full of foolishness, but punishment can get rid of it. Come on, somebody. My son, my son got upset one time. <laughs> His grades were slipping. Uh, my older he got a gift of an Xbox. And the moment that Xbox came into my house, my, his grades started going down. He'd be up all night playing Xbox. He knew every move, every counterpoint part, everything. But his math grades, his English grades, his everything, everything was going down. <laughs> and I, it's, it's like, next report, I said, I gave him my answer. So your grades are going to come up. Oh, I'm taking that thing. And the next report card came out, and it didn't come up. So guess what dad did? I took that Xbox. You know, he told me, that's my Xbox. I said, it is your Xbox. It's my house. It's my room you're sleeping in. It's my electricity. Everything else is mine. Where are you going to plug it into? He passed. Now, I'm going to say, we weren't, he dropped me from his Facebook. I'm going to say, aww. I wasn't part of his social media anymore. He was mad I took his Xbox. But how many know that God didn't call me to be your bestie? He called me to be your parent. We can work on being besties when you get older. Amen? But in the meantime, there's a job to do, and parenting is not easy. And it's not for those who are, listen, listen, listen. If you want some pointers, just talk to my mama or any Caribbean parent. Come on, somebody. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. But having said all that, <laughs> Listen, there's an environment in which we have to discipline them. Because at the end of the day, they have to know, because I, I mentioned that Jamaican family, they were hugging the family by the end of the week. I'm missing you. They're crying. They're crying. They're crying. They're missing the Jamaican family who disciplined them and out of love and let them and put, put you know, parameters and, and boundaries in place. How I many know kids need that? They need to know where the line is. People always say, Pastor Rick, where's the line? And some people's line is all the way out here. You know what that means? They're all the way out here. That means that kid gets away with anything. All the way out there. And then some people's lines are too close and the kid can't breathe. I'm not talking about that either. I'm talking about somewhere right here. All right? You know, I'm not waiting for my kids to cuss me out or to cuss a, a teacher out or something like that. No, I'm dealing with it right here. So we don't have to get to here, sleeping around and doing drugs and acting like knuckleheads. Come on, somebody. We need to know where it is, but there's an environment that we need to create. And all of this is, is a loving environment. So parent role, that's your first feeling. You got to be loving. Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, don't exasperate your children, 
by coming down hard on them, take them by the hand, and lead them in the way of the master. Now, exasperate means to, to make somebody very angry or frustrated, often by repeatedly doing something annoying. How many, there are some people who just get off on annoying people, and, and they like to annoy their children that way. I was with, with a couple, and the guy just kept grabbing the lady and, you know, putting his hand on her head, and, and she kept taking it off and, you know, doing all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm getting frustrated just watching this. It's annoying, and we keep doing that, we keep doing that, and we do that stuff to our kids just to get a reaction. That's not cool. That's not good. The Bible says do not exasperate your children, but be loving. At the same time, we need to be clear and consistent. Write that down. In other words, say what you mean and mean what you say. James 4, 8 says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, and don't be double-minded. Come on, somebody. If you don't stop that, I'm going to do this. And then they don't stop it, and nothing happens. Right. Or it happens inconsistently. You just you don't follow through. How I many know your kids know that you ain't going to follow through? You go into some people's houses, and the level in order to get the kids' attention, is all the way up here. They're screaming at the top of their lungs. I'm like, oh, my God, there's going to be an exorcism. <laughs> She's going to lose her mind. And the reason that happens is because you've trained your kids not to hear you until you get to that level. You're not consistent. Matthew 5.37 says, simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. James 5.12 says, but most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple, help me out somebody, yes or no, so that you will not sin and be condemned for it. In other words, don't make promises you can't keep. So now there are those who say, I swear by the temple, by the hair, my head, by, I mean, but, but I got my fingers crossed. Or we'll say we're going to do something, especially with kids. We're going to go hang out. We're going to go fishing. We're going to go to movies. And then that day comes, and there ain't no hanging out. There ain't no fishing. There ain't no movie. Your yes is not yes, and your no is not no. And if you got to go beyond yes and no, I promise, I swear, the Bible says you are in the devil's camp. Your word should be your bond. If you say yes, it should mean, help me out somebody. I think I'm only preaching to like three of you or five of you. If you say yes, then your word should be, and if you say no, then your word should be, and anything beyond yes or no, that should be, there shouldn't be anything else. Are you coming to church next week? Are you scheduled to serve on the children's ministry next week? Some of you are. <laughs> My point is, if you say yes, mean it. If I say I'm going to serve in the children's ministry, and I got to be there at 9.30 or 9.25, I should be there at 9.30, 9.25. I should not be calling at 9.15. Say, oh, I can't make it. I'm a little bit tired. I got a headache. I'm not talking about real emergencies. You know what I'm saying? So whatever your yes is, it shouldn't be anything beyond that. Yes, I'm coming to church. Yes, I'll be there to help you clean your you know, mow your lawn or whatever. Yes, I will drive you to school. Yes, I will. No. And then they, sometimes the no works the same way. You don't want to hurt people's feelings. And then you say, I'll pray about it. <laughs> I'll pray about it means no. I've learned that. I'll let you know. Because you don't want to hurt people's feelings, so you don't give them the right answer. Because just say, can, can, can you help move me uh, in, in, two, in two days? No. I'm busy. 
Yeah, but you're a Christian. You're a pastor. I said, no. Don't look for me. If I'm not busy, I'll be there, and I'll tell you yes. And if I can't be there, I will tell you no. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. And that, that, that has to do with rewards as well. So if you're making promises that you're not following through, it's inconsistent, and you're not being clear. In addition, you need to be calm. Someone say be calm. James 1, 19 through 20 says, My dear brothers and sisters, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. And this is why. He says, Your anger can never make things right in God's sight. That's right. You just don't understand. You don't, you don't do anything unless I, unless I get up. Unless I go from zero to stupid and two seconds. Ah! Don't put that on the highlight reel. Listen, the Bible says my anger does not, let me read that again. It says your anger can never make things right in God's sight. Your anger is not what, God doesn't need you getting angry to help him do his job. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so you might as well hold, hold your peace. Let your, let your yes be yes, you know, be no, and I'm telling you to do it. And then if they don't do it, let the consequences come down. And I'm not just talking about you know, spankings. I'm talking about take things, punishment. I'm like, my kid's out of control. Your kid is totally dependent on you. I don't understand that. For their food, <laughs> for their clothing, for their drive, for that phone that they're, that they're talking on the, take the phone back. Well, 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 I can't, I can't do that. But that's why they're out of control. You can't do that. Did you give him the phone? Take it back. I know the young people are like, I got set up today. This is, gra <laughs> this is graduation Sunday. And Pastor Rick is just messing up my whole game. <laughs> Things are changing in my house right before my eyes. And, 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 and I, I was supposed to be recognized for graduating. <laughs> okay. God bless you guys. <laughs> I have a friend, I'm going to just say it that way. And the kids were acting up. And he. He demanded to take the phone, and those kids took the phone back <laughs> and jumped on him. <laughs> and uh, he said, what should I do? I said, I don't even know what to tell you. <laughs> you, you your kids drive your phone back after you took it and then jumped on you to fight you for the phone? <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I said, you want me to come over? We could tag team them. <laughs> but I just can't imagine my kids doing that. It's like, oh, my goodness. Someone said you got to start young. Train them up in the way they should go. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to take a detour. But if you train them up in the way they should go, eventually those seeds will get in there. Come on, somebody. They'll get back. They'll come back. It might take them a while, but by hook or by crook, how many of you know that Jesus will leave the 99 and go after the one? And your child might be that one. And so he might have taken a detour, but you've done your job. You played your role. You've told them about Jesus. You put them in an environment where they hear about Christ. You've taught them right from wrong. You put them on a path. And now they're taking a work on the wild side. But listen to me, they ain't going to stay out there <laughs> because when they get old, they're coming back. They're going to be fighting against the word that you've planted there because you've done your job. Turn to somebody, look them in the eye. Say, do your job, man. And then next you got to be forgiving. Say, be forgiving. Ephesians 4.26 says, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry. But don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. 
And don't go to bed angry. And don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. And so as parents, we got to model this. I mean, there's some of us, we're worse than elephants, man. We never forget nothing. And your kids know it, that you're holding things against them forever and ever. Amen. Let it go. And the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And so we need to walk in forgiveness. We need, yes, they blow it. So, so, so they blow it. Guess what? So did you. Any perfect people in here? Anybody was a perfect child in here? Come on, somebody. I promise you I wasn't. Just ask my mama. She's right there. I got that rod of correction more times than I'd like to remember. And discipline, and I was the black sheep of the family. And so when I told my mama, I, I believe God's calling me into the ministry, I think she laughed at me. <laughs> Child, you confused. <laughs> I think she thinks it was supposed to be my younger brother. <laughs> God is good, right? And so if you know you acted like a fool when you were younger, why are you pretending? Why is this child acting this way? Because he come from you. <laughs> He's got your, your seed in him, your DNA. You act like you don't remember. You know what I'm talking about. Everybody knows what, I'm talk, what we're talking about. We just don't tell the kids. And when the old people come around, the people who used to call me Ricky. Where's Bob? Bob's in the house today. Where's he? Are you in here? Bob? Bob's one of my oldest friends from 30 years ago. We got the back together on Facebook. He's coming into town. You know, there's a group of people who call me Ricky. And they call me Ricky because... Before, before I had my son, and he was named Ricardo after me, we couldn't call both of us Ricky, so I gave him Ricky, and then I went to Rick. But there's a whole bunch of people that when they come around, hi, Ricky, hi, Ricky, and I haven't heard that in a while, but that's what they call me. But they know stories about me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it's good to keep them at a distance sometimes. <laughs> and I was telling my kids, don't believe all the stories. Don't believe everything you hear. But I'm not even trying to pretend. I know I was, I know I need Jesus, amen? I'm grateful for the grace of God that God poured on my life. I'm just as surprised as the next guy that he called me to be a pastor and a preacher. Listen to me. I'm grateful and I'm surprised. And there were times when I said to God, you sure you got the right person? <laughs> so I'm say thank God for his grace. But God's called us to be forgiving. And stop acting like, you know, we never got done anything wrong because we've done things wrong and we needed to be forgiven for it. And God forgave us. And so let us continue to do it and, 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 and do what God has done for us, other people, especially our own families. We're talking about a fuller life. Come on, somebody. Amen. A fuller family. A better family. Ephesians 4.32 says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted. Help me out, somebody forgiving one another, and then he says how we should forgive him, just as God through Christ has forgiven me. And so if God wants us to treat other people with forgiveness, certainly he wants us to treat our family that way. Amen? Where are my youth at? We're on to you now. Oh, he said, oh, we're just not getting on to the youth? Yeah, oh, yeah, we are not. That was to the parents. Now we're talking to the youth. Youth. I want to see the whites of your eyes. This is what the Bible says. It says you need to be obedient. Yes, write this down. Be obedient. Ephesians 6, 1 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is... This is right. It's getting quiet in here. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. And here's the promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. First commandment with a promise. 
Honor your father and your mother that, it might, that you might live long and that it might go well with you in the land. And so, the, so if honoring them brings a blessing and long life, what does dishonoring them do? Come on, somebody. Things that make you, things that make you go, hmm. I just hope you think about that. Be obedient. Children, obey your parents. And I, I put a caveat. You should obey your parents if they're telling you to do things that are right to do. I mean, if, they, if, if, if they're telling you to do anything illegal or immoral, certainly that doesn't mean obey them. But wash the dishes is not illegal or immoral. <laughs> Clean your room is not illegal or immoral. Help out watching your little brother, your sister is not. Come on, somebody. If they ask you to rob a bank with them, don't do it. But pretty much everything else. All right? Also, to my youth, he says, be wise. Be wise. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And so it says, flee evil desires and run after things that are right and full of faith and love and peace, along with those who call on the Lord, which means that at some point, guys and girls, you might have to start picking different friends, especially if your friends are constantly getting you in trouble. You might have to pick a different group of friends, all right, because you're going to start to be associated with the people that you hang out with. And you're going to start picking up habits. So the Bible says, it literally says, it says, pursue righteousness along with those who call on the Lord. So find a group of kids who are running after Jesus just like you and get, jump in with that group. Does that make sense? Second Timothy 2.22, the New Living says, run from anything that stimulates youth for lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace, and joy, the, com the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. That means also you got to figure out, okay, well, if they're having parties and whatnot, you might have to get out of there. Amen? Don't put yourself in situations where you're going to fall into temptation where it's going to take you out, all right? And then the next one for you is to be an example. The scripture for that is 1 Timothy 4.12, 4.12, and this is what it says. It says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But help me out, somebody. But what does it say? But set an example for the believers in, in what? In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. Keep, the, keep that up there for one second. So young people, to give you, what is it, five areas in which you are to set an example? You are to set an example in the things that you say. That's your speech. That's the things coming out your mouth. That's how oh, everybody's cursing. You don't have to curse. Amen? Everybody's talking trash. You don't have to do that. And so set an example in the things that's coming out your mouth. In your conduct. What's your conduct? That's, that's your behavior. Act right. <laughs> Amen? And then it talks about in, 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 your, in love, and, and, and that's how you respond to people. That's how, that's how you're supposed to respond to people, in your faith. That's, that's trusting God even through difficult situations. And in your purity, purity is your relationships. It's, in, it's making a decision that I am going to, I'm going to not do what the world is doing, not do what the college people are doing, but I'm going to live my life, and I'm going to live it unto the Lord for an audience of one. And if that means being pure until God brings that man or that woman into my life, that's what you're going to do. I, I got one amen from one of the youth. I, I want to hear another amen from at least three other youth. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I'm waiting for the person God brings into my life, and I'm going to live pure. And I'm going to wait until I get a ring on my finger. I know it's not popular. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. If you want a blessed, full of life, we're going to start doing it God's way.
And then lastly, you're going to be a learner. Say a learner. Okay, the Bible told us to train up a child in the way they should go. If there's a trainer, there must be a trainee. Youth, guess what? That's you. Can I ask you a question? When did we stop learning? I promise you, we never stop learning. We never stop learning. In, ter in, in terms of everything, we continue to learn. So I humble myself. I don't know everything. I've not arrived yet. Um, most... Most of my degrees I got after I got married. My wife just completed her bachelor's. Go on, where she has with her bad self. This is graduation Sunday. You know, you never stop learning. All right? And so, young people, you are the trainees, and you are in a position where God is asking you to learn. Now, watch this. Here's the goal. Luke chapter 6, verse 40, red letter edition, which means that Jesus is speaking. And this is what he said. He says, students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained, say fully trained, will become like the teacher. So once you're fully trained, once you start to become mature, you're going to become like the teacher. And who's the teacher? Come on, somebody. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Parenting is not easy, but he expects us to do it with his grace because, in fact, that's what he's doing in all of our lives. And so to all of us, I'm asking whether it's parent or student, you know, whether it's mother or father or children, I'm asking us, in order for us to create an environment that, that, uh, that we are going to become all that God wants us to be, we need to be understanding. Write that down, understanding. And, I, and this is what God wants you to understand. And I'm going to read this scripture, and then we're going to end and go into our and go into our cer ceremony. But it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, it says, And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, listen, listen, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines, help me, those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. And as you endure this divine discipline, I love how it says that divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit each submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years but the best they knew the best they knew how but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening it's what it's painful but afterwards there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. And so to everybody, God wants us to understand that if we call ourselves children of God and God is our Father, He will discipline us. He will correct us. He will get us to the place where He says, okay, you're doing this, but I'm going to ask you to stop doing that. And then sometimes... If you continue to do it, mm, you might get a holy spanking from heaven. Oh, my God. I'm just saying. I never, I, never, I never heard anyone shout hallelujah to a spiritual beating. But I'm just saying. Because it says it's painful at the time. But it says it will produce in you a harvest of righteousness or right living. He says if you're not being disciplined by the Father, you don't belong to him. It's just like when my kids would come home and they say, Dad, I, you know, I want to go, at the time I restricted rated R movies, I want to go to, to this rated R movie. I say, no. And then they would say, well, such and such as parents, let them go see it. I said, I said and my response would be, I'm not such and such as parents. I'm your parent. And if you go to that, you will be dealing with me. Comprende? I, 
I'm not responsible for such and such a parents. I'm responsible for disciplining my kids. And whoever their parents are are responsible for this. And so he says, if you're not being disciplined by the Father, he says, you don't belong to him. And so, yes, in a way I can say, okay, Lord, bring on whatever correction that I need so that I might live right, have the right attitude, have the right demeanor. You know, whatever I got to do to get on the right path, Lord, I'm willing for that. Amen? So understand that that's what's going on. But in that context, we need to be understanding toward each other as well. We all have a role to play. Husband, wife, father, mother, and children, young and old. And when we know our role, listen to me, things just work a whole lot better. Amen? As we come to a close, we're going to close this portion up. And then I'm going to recognize those who have been graduating. And so... Okay, and so the most important thing is have you accepted Christ as your Savior and your Lord? And if you've not yet done that, I want to give everyone an opportunity to do just that. Because the role Jesus played, how many of you know he completed his role, amen? He was the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. And it wasn't his sins that he died for. He died for my sins, your sins, and everybody else's sins. And so, and then he offers it, uh, forgiveness and grace for, to everyone who repent and give their lives to him. And, and I don't want to ever get through a service without giving everyone an opportunity to do just that. If you've not yet accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord, it will be my privilege and my honor to lead you in a prayer of commitment to him. And while we're doing that, too, if anything I said kind of, okay, kind of, all right, I, I could do better in that area during this prayer time, you're going to start turning that stuff over to me. Lord, I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better mother. Give me your way. I want to be a better child, okay? I, you know, so this is that time where we're going to open up in our hearts a, a spiritual altar to the Lord and allow him to bring the correction that we need. Is, is that okay? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you've not yet accepted Christ and you would like to say something like this from your heart or if you need to recommit your life to Jesus say Heavenly Father I come before you today I thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love and your correction thank you for sending your son Jesus to pay the penalty for my sins I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. Came, lived a sinless life, died a cruel cross, three days later rose from the dead. And because he lived, I will live as well as I put my trust in him and in you. Today, Lord, I trust you for my salvation of my soul. Thank you. Thank you. Well, every head is bowed and every eye is closed. If God is speaking to you about your role, and maybe you can improve or get things better. Give him permission to put a check in your heart and in your attitude. I need to be a better husband, wife, parent, youth. Because one day you're going to grow up and you're going to be a parent as well. Say, Lord, make me into the man and woman that you've called me to be. I want to get things right by you. I commit this time to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.